Thank you very much for that introduction, Budget. While we're just sorting out the last bit, the technical thing there, can I ask how many of you in the audience are researchers or think of yourself as active researchers? Okay, most of you. That, that's good. That's what I was led to suspect. My talk today is mainly addressed at you. I've come here with a message really for the folks who are researchers. The rest of you, uh, I hope it's interesting, um, but uh, it may not seem quite as directed at, at, at what matters to you. Uh, so I've been asked really to talk about both, both to think about why are we doing this, the benefits of, of open data, both uh, to us as individuals and to society uh, as a whole. And one way of summarising uh, what I'm going to say is simply that I'm going to start with trying to remind us why is this important. We've already heard quite a bit about this and what gets in the way of it. And to think about some of the things that are related, it's not just about data. We need other things to make sense of data, as Mark, I think, made very clear earlier. And, and, and then to go back and, and, and re reinforce uh, that case. But another way of looking at it is that this is going to be, it's about being selfish. It's about doing what, for you as a researcher, is going to help you in your career. That's going to really be my primary focus, because I want to motivate you. Uh, to do this, and about doing just enough, not about being perfect at the moment, but about doing just enough to make your data shareable while still giving some benefit to other people as well as, as being that selfish person as well. And also I'm going to focus on what you can do now. I think you're going to be hearing from other people, uh, and, and, and we do at the Digital Creation Centre, do work on, on the future, on the things that we need to build, on the things that might be possible in a different form of digital scholarship in the future. But my message really is, you know, I want you to concentrate on, on what could I do today to make my data more usable, more shareable, more available. And the material you're going to hear from me today is not just for me, and my thanks to a number of people, in particular Neil Chu Hong, who's done a lot of work on the release of software, on Dave Flanders, who's now at the University of Melbourne, but used to be based in the UK, done a lot of work around open research, to all my colleagues at the DCC, I'm reusing lots of their work, uh, and to Cameron Naylor, uh, who's a really passionate advocate uh, for open science, uh, and I've used some of his material today. So, in the introduction, Wojtek said a little about this organisation I come from, the Digital Curation Centre. It's based in the UK and our mission is to increase the capability and capacity for UK universities and indeed for others elsewhere, the funding comes uh, from elsewhere, to support the reuse uh, uh, and, and preservation of research data. This isn't just a UK issue, we've heard this is an international concern, so we have to work within the context of organisations like CoData, like the Research Data Alliance, uh, to make sure that, that we're doing this in a coordinated way across the world. Inter research is an international activity. And if you look a bit closer, that's the homepage on our website, our strap line. Good research needs good data. That really informs everything that we do, and I hope to persuade you it needs to inform what you do as well. So, I thought I need to be in, perhaps not all of you really believe that this data reuse is a real thing. Perhaps this is just what these politicians are talking about, saying, oh yes, we must have more of this because it's efficient, and you're saying, no. nobody, nobody really does this. Everyone creates their own data. So I'm gonna give a few examples, you've already heard some from, from, from Mark, uh, to, to persuade you that it happens. The Old Weather Project, any of you heard of, of this? It's a very UK-based thing, one or two, yeah. So Mark, yes, I, I'm aware you know about this. So I think this is a really good example of how information can be reused again and again and again. These are ships' logbooks from, I think, from the, the, the 18th to the 19th century. So these are not created for research, they're created for administrative purposes. They record all sorts of things about the ship's voyage, and, and for whatever reason, Military archivists keep all of these things from, from, from the past. They've now been digitized and information is being extracted from them that tells us about things like wind speed and temperature from the past, recorded every three hours. Really precise past measurements of the weather that can be used to validate the climate models that we have now. So uh, something that the people who created this did really, really didn't expect. Going back to that point that Mark made that, that 
you, the data creator, cannot anticipate what else can be done with your data. But this is actually not the first time this information has been reused. There's all sorts of other information in those logbooks. Information about the cargoes that were taken on off the ships. Those have been used by economists in the past and historians to model the flow of trade and, again, to validate models about trade in, in the past. And as a result of this digitization and the crowdsourcing that's extracting the data, other people, family historians, have realized that another part of the record tells us who got on the ship, who got off the ship, what role do they have, and that's being used by family historians again. Three different reuses of that original data that was never even created for research in the first place. Now that's, not every example is like that, but it demonstrates, I think, the potential. It's data that's being used in research, but it's not from research. Now, I haven't really got time to go through lots of other examples. Here are a few more that, that, that if, you, if you want to Google a few, you can find or a look at some of my other talks in the past where I've gone into these in, in, in more detail. But the reuse of data from archaeology, for instance, to inform paleontology, two disciplines that are working at very different timescales, one on tens of thousands of years, one on hundreds of millions uh, uh, of years. Uh, another example from research uh, in radar that, that, that where essentially the data that was essentially useful in one research context was the noise that was being stripped out of the data for another research purpose. So uh, valuable lessons both. And although this talk is about open research data, I want to qualify that a little because you know clearly not all the data we produce in research can just be stuck out there on the internet and made available to anybody for any purpose with no further checks. And there are lots of reasons why we can't do that, and most of them are to do with research on human subjects. But there's still a type of openness that we can give to this data, its existence. I cannot necessarily let you have all the data without knowing something about you, but it's important that I tell you this data exists. I did this experiment. Here are the characteristics of the data, and that way you know that you don't have to repeat the experiment and you can have a discussion with me about whether or not we can share the data. It allows negotiation on reuse and it avoids people pointlessly repeating other people's research because we don't know the data exists. And that's a flaw that we have at the moment. Often when data is not open, even its existence is hidden from us. It's not always obvious, I think, what we can make open. So, again, perhaps I'll, I'll, I'll try asking a question here. Let's. Um, Say I've got some genomic data. Uh, let's say it's Mark's, perhaps. Uh, do you think I should put that on the internet and say, here is Mark Parsons' complete DNA data? Would that be a fair thing to do? No, nobody, nobody really thinks it is, and, and, and I agree. Identifiable you know, genomic data is not the sort of thing in general that... But if I think it's okay. What? But if I think it's okay. If you think it's okay, that's fine. <laughs> yeah. But it needs to be informed <laughs> consent, I think. If, if we don't explain to you, here are the potential implications of doing that. Uh, you, you know, you, it, it wouldn't be a good thing to do. But if it was an anonymous human subject, you know, there's still a lot we can find out from DNA. Maybe we can de-anonymize that, I, I, I'm not sure. But usually as we move down this, people get less and less worried. You know, if it's your pet dog, maybe you still worry about whether or not it's the right <laughs> thing to say, well, no, that's Mark's dog. Whereas I suppose this is just some anonymous dog from some particular laboratory anywhere. <laughs> and mammals in general, insects, are we really worried about protecting their personal data? Probably not. <laughs> Plants, even less so. Virus is right down at the bottom of the scale, but actually, it's right down at the bottom of that scale where people have got really worried, again, about putting open data on the internet. You may remember a couple of years ago arguments about whether even a paper should be published about work that had been done to understand what do you do to the flu virus to recreate an epidemic. And where many, many people felt this is the sort of data, this almost this is an experiment that should never have been done. And even if it is done, we should think a lot about whether we should tell anybody what we found out. Because the potential there is to create a weapon, perhaps. So these ideas about you know, what you can put on the, uh, what you can make open and whatnot are not always straightforward. But there are some messages from that data reuse, and that, the, that often there are things to find in your data, as Mark said before, that your own publications don't tell you. The data creators cannot always anticipate the reuse, that we're often taking data 
that isn't coming from other researchers but from other sources. Open data is bigger than open research. That what's noise to you is signal, perhaps, to somebody else. And also the point that came up in one of the earlier questions, that if we only discover data within a narrow domain of research, we're not going to achieve the reuse potential that we want. We need to be able to discover data across disciplines and across domains and connect up the systems that we've got. And there are good reasons of caring about this. We invest a lot in creating data. We invest resources in doing that. And the reuse potential allows us to get the most from that investment. There are other reasons as well. I'm not really going to go in to, to the motivations around the legal and regulatory and accountability concerns today. And if we get it right, we can improve all of these things. The quality of the research, the more data we have, the closer we can get to the truths that we're hoping to get to. The speed that we can get to that underlying truth. Uh, and the amount of money it takes to get there. Hopefully, we can, we can improve all of those things. For slightly less money, we can get to, to the same quality of research, or for the same amount of money, we can do the research more quickly, uh, and it can produce better results. And improving any of those things is of interest to all of us. This is not something where our interests are in conflict. Whether you're a data creator, whether you're a data reuser, whether you're the university where that research happens, or whether you're the people that pay for it, getting each of those things better is something that you want to happen. Therefore, this is, this is something where, you know, it's a, it's a game where we all win, hopefully. And, and you know, organisations recognise this. So I thought we've got things at the level of the G8, something I never thought would happen a few years ago, that we would get that level of interest in the idea of open data. And let's look at those numbers a bit more closely, just looking at the UK. Now, these are figures that are now a couple of years old. Uh, I'm afraid I haven't updated uh, this slide since I first created it. Uh, so the figures may be a little different now, but they're, they're not, in general terms, they're still the same. There are 164 universities. Now, not all of them are research intensive. Some of them do teaching only. But at 71 of them, more than 5% of the income is coming from research. At 115 of them, there's at least a million uh, a year coming out. It's a million UK uh, pounds. I'll be translating that into local currency at a moment. Total expenditure. Uh, of publicly funded research around 4.4 billion. So that's about 26 billion lotties, as I understand, unless you change your money at the airport, but apparently it's only 22 billion lotties, <laughs> I don't understand why. Uh, but, but we'd assume that governments are not using the airport exchange uh, rates. So it's a significant investment uh, in, in, in the UK. And a few years ago, we the business case for creating some infrastructure and investing in the sort of organisations like the PCC turned out to be really straightforward, that just investing an extra 1.5 million a year in creating that infrastructure that enables data reuse, getting the skills into the universities, getting discovery uh, infrastructure going, and assuming that it's going to take five years, you know, you start investing this money but nothing really happens for a while. You don't really get any data going in there, or, or even if you do, you don't get the reuse happening. But then once that five years has gone, you can assume that there's about 10,000 data sets a year coming out of that 4.4 billion that's going into research. And we assume that most of it will never ever be reused, like most articles are never ever read or never ever cited. Only one in a hundred of them is going to get reused every year. But each time it's reused, it saves about, this is a very conservative estimate, you save about 30,000 on the research. That, that's the, a very average amount of how much is spent in a typical research project on collecting data as opposed to analysing it and making conclusions. And we're also assuming, we recognise in there that when you reuse somebody else's data, it's a bit harder than using your own. So there's a, a, a factor for that in there. But that still means that your saving every year is twice your investment in creation of this infrastructure. And that's with some very, very conservative numbers. It pays back very, very quickly. That's a simple argument. And it's also important to make sure that we don't just make the data available that comes from the successful projects, that comes from the ones where you publish an article. As Cameron Nalen pointed out in, a, in a, an address at our conference a few years ago, 95% of research results are never published because we didn't get the results we expected or wanted. We don't think we've got uh, a publication out of it. And imagine 
all those people repeating all these experiments and, as far as they're concerned, failing. Not failing to get measurements. Often these experiments produce data that's valid. You've made some measurements and they're good measurements. They just don't tell the story that you wanted to tell. And therefore nobody knows that data exists. Or nobody knows that that particular experiment didn't work, perhaps some of them more catastrophically than others. These are the sorts of things we don't want to, to repeat. But think how much money is wasted on that repetition because you don't know that somebody else has even done the experiment before that you want to do now. And finally, one more public benefit I'll argue for in medical research, patient safety. The, the, this is a story from the Thai Entire Educational Supplement a few years ago about one particular scandal, a real scandal to do with what in the end was fake research that we would have spotted so much earlier had the data from particular clinical trials been available. This was research about chemotherapy. Human beings suffered and are now suing the researchers involved because uh, of these particular experiments. We blogged about it on, on the DCC website. It was, a, to me, a really persuasive case for why data in general should be made uh, available. And there, there are big uh, arguments you may have heard of the oil trials movement that are now trying to assure that this is standard in future, that data from clinical experiments is always made available. And the university involved, um, you know, they've suffered some severe reputational damage as well. You search for anything to do with, with Duke and, and clinical research at the moment, and the word fraud keeps coming up. That is not the message that the university wants to be sending out about its research. So I, I began by saying I'm going to be talking about the selfish benefits to you, the research, and I've been talking only about the benefits to us as society. And you may be thinking, again, that these are in conflict. Now I'm going to talk to you now about, okay, the, the, that's the big public money argument. Why should you care? Well, one perhaps not very good reason is that because of that recognition, the funders are now beginning to make demands on you. We've heard about what the European Commission are asking in terms of open data. There are many examples from the UK, and we're seeing a worldwide trend, more and more funders recognising that these policy initiatives make sense and that they're beginning to make requirements on you. So understanding how to do this in advance means that you'll be ahead of your peers, perhaps, uh, and being able to respond uh, when, when funders in Poland and elsewhere begin to make demands of you. You'll be a more mobile researcher, being able to move to other countries where these policy requirements already exist. But perhaps more, um, you know, less a, a, a benefit to the compliance, but one that gives you real benefit, is that we've got lots of evidence that when you have findable data, citable data, it has value. When you link publications and data together, it increases the citations both to the data as a thing in itself and to that publication. That increases reuse, but that citation benefit is something that really matters to you in your career uh, as a researcher. And we also have evidence that even if you don't produce a paper about your data, even if it's just the data that's available, that effect still exists as long as the data is archived in a repository somewhere as long as it's citable and as long as it's discoverable. If people can find it, you can get credit for the fact that you've created good data. So again, there's a benefit here for all the people involved. And if you don't believe me, there's been a fair amount of research on this and a number of different domains that shows this effect. The effect is different in different areas. The, the study that everyone cited uh, initially was the second one there by, by Heather Pivovar and Todd Vision. It looked at a very specific domain, microarray data in, in the uh, molecular biology. 9% uh, increase there. Lots of people said, well, okay, but you know, genetics, it's different. You know, this doesn't necessarily apply in my area of research. Much bigger study, also Pietro and Lyle, 240% increase in citation rate. That was a very broad study in social sciences and the humanities. And I think that shows a very positive effect. And here we begin to say, this is not just genetics. Another study uh, in astronomy showing a similar effect. Astronomers now, they've really picked up on this. We, instead of getting astronomers who are worried about sharing their research data, we get people approaching us who are saying, I can't find where to put my data, but I want to make it available because I know this effect exists. So there's demand there from particular research communities. Again, these slides will be available and the, the, the references uh, are, are all there. 
And having these types of infrastructures available is beginning to show us that, that, that you can change the traditional model of how we do this. This is uh, an example uh, of uh, a paper that got a lot of exposure uh, about a year or so ago. You may have heard about the Google flu idea. Google is saying that just by looking at searches, we can predict when there are going to be flu epidemics. Some academics show that actually this doesn't work the way you might believe it does. And they didn't need to use a huge amount of data to get that result. But more importantly to me, I think it's interesting that the data behind that was made available before the paper was even published using a system called Dataverse. They had a paper accepted for publication, but the data went live first, pointing to the paper that would appear later on. They got huge amounts of publicity because of that. Probably more so than the paper itself would have got later, and it didn't undermine their research in any way. They still got the credit for what they did. So I hope I persuade you this is a good idea. And now you're saying, oh yes, but there's lots of things that get in my way. Or perhaps you still have some excuses. I'm not going to go into all of these now. We don't have the time to, to get into the detail. But you'll be aware of those simple ones around technology. I mean, my career, unfortunately, goes a lot further to the left. I mean, some of those <laughs> technologies are still quite new to me, uh, I'm afraid. Uh, and you don't want to know about the punch cards uh, that, 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 that I have at home. But, but there are many other reasons. You stick things like this in a drawer, technology changes, you keep thinking, I'll do something with that, it gets in the way. Or, or you always think, I'm going to exploit it a bit further. Um, these are the sorts of excuses. Carly Strasser uh, has done a lot of work on this blogging about the types of excuses you get, why not to do this, and, and, and the, uh, some answers to give uh, to, to those things. You might recognise one or two of your own feelings in there. I've encountered this a lot. I've probably been guilty of one of these two things. There are reasons to argue against all of these, including even the ones where you're thinking, this is embarrassing. You know, I don't want anyone else to look at this. It's still potentially useful. You need to get over that sort of idea. And, and repositories help distance us a little uh, from, from the data. Release it anonymously if you're really that worried about it. Let's, let's face it. I'm going to talk a little about software as well, because I think there are lots of similar issues about what we need to be open. We often need software to make sense of data. And if we have one open data, having a closed software environment around it is going to be, is going to be a barrier to that reuse. But you may wonder what it is that, that why software has really got to, use, to do with your research. Well, the Software Sustainability Institute in the UK, who do very similar work to us around the issues of software, uh, have done some surveys uh, on researchers in all disciplines, showing that in many, many cases, software is, is critical uh, to, to the use uh, of the research. Only 11% of those surveyed said that, OK, if you took away the software I'm using, I'd still be able to do my research. I wouldn't really worry. Or all of them would say, nearly all of them would say, it'd either be impossible or it'd be extremely difficult without the open software that's available. And you know, research in general depends not just on reusing that data, but, but on being able to reuse software, to reuse the models and the workflows that other people use in order to really accomplish open science. And again, I won't go into this in depth at the moment, but it's intriguing to note that many of the arguments we put around data and making data open also apply to software. There are similar barriers in the way, uh, there are similar effects that we see with making your data open that increase the citation uh, to the, the underlying software. The, these are barriers identified uh, by Victoria Stodden. There's the, many of the phrases there we can see, potential loss of future publications, um, dealing with questions from people not receiving the attribution. These are all the concerns that people have around uh, data. And there are the support available to many of us who, uh, we had a comment from one of the earlier speakers was saying, you know, we, we shouldn't all be trying to be experts in this area. It's not our job all to be data scientists. Uh, but these courses around something called software carpentry try to deal with giving you just enough skills as a researcher to know just enough about the software and the infrastructure that the engineers over on the left-hand side of this are created to allow you to exploit it appropriately. Look out for these software carpentry courses and a related set of courses that have been made freely available called data carpentry, applying many of the same principles to give you just enough 
data skills to be able to make your own data more reusable and to understand how to exploit other people's uh, data more effectively. There's also a big infrastructure now that's allowing us to just publish data without necessarily needing to publish findings about it and also to publish software. Now just a couple of years ago I would have had a very small list of the places where we can do this. The Software Sustainability Institute maintain a list on their website of the journals in which you can publish software. It's now a rather long list. In fact, it's far too big to get on here and it's growing all the time. This is a real change that's been taking place in academic scholarship in just a few years. And there's similar assistance to that which I mentioned for the, the exploiting software that's available to help you with some of those concerns around data sharing as well. If you feel that you're still not confident in some of the techniques that you might need to use or in, in, in finding an appropriate place to put your data, for instance. With data management planning, there are services we produce, one in the UK, DMP Online. There's a similar thing called DMP Tool that's available uh, in the USA that, that guide you through these issues of producing these data management plans that, um, that many, many funders want. It tries to make you think about the issues. It gives you suggestions uh, for how you might want to approach certain questions and in particular it's got guidance that's specific to particular domains that says okay how would you approach these questions if you're an archaeologist, if you're an astronomer, if you're a physicist um, uh, because the meanings of many open questions around data management have different uh, you know, different domain specific interpretations. There's guidance available from us and others on things like how to choose what to keep. We can't keep all the data we produce. We have to be quite selective, uh, particularly in disciplines that are generating large quantities of data. And this sort of guidance will help you as a researcher and it will help the people you're working with in your universities, in those domain repositories, to, to choose the data that's most sensible to keep for the long term. There's guidance on how to make your data citable and guidance on how to, to cite other people's data so that, that we, we keep this infrastructure and ecology uh, of reuse and citation going. There's online courses, really simple self-paced online training that you can use, and that's my warning, but well, I've got five minutes left, uh, that you can use to uh, improve your research skills, to learn how to, uh, particularly around data, mantra, uh, is one of the most well known. It was produced by some colleagues uh, at the University of Edinburgh, originally aimed at social scientists, but it's been extended and reworked since then to apply again to, to, to many different domains. I'd encourage you, if you think you need to top up your skills in some way, uh, to, to, to look at that. I'm going to end really by reiterating uh, some of the messages. I hope I've persuaded you that sharing data is good for you as a researcher. I have hope I persuaded you that it's a thing that benefits us all as a society. And I hope also I've given you some indication that it, it, doing this is not as hard as you might think it is. I'm not claiming it's easy in every respect, but that, that it's not something you need to do on your own. There's a lot of help and guidance available. And if you're not already made, making your data open and sharing it, please start today. Thanks very much. Thank you, Kevin, for this uh, interesting overview and for the persuasion. And we are surprisingly well on time, so I think we can have some questions if, if there are any. Okay. Um, Always the difficult question. <laughs> So you mentioned the need to share software as well as data, and I think that's very true and very critical, and it's a growing issue, and it presents some additional complexities in, in as uh, sharing data does. And we have the same issues of incentive that Jon Claude talked about, and you gave the example of, all right, so there's some software journals out there now. So, oh, okay, so now we can publish our software in journals. Is that really an appropriate incentive? As software developers, in many cases, are not assessed in the same way as research scientists. 
and that may not, it may actually just be a detraction from what they do. So I'm, I, I, I'm just really interested in your comments on aligning the incentives with okay. software sharing as opposed to data sharing. So thanks, that's, I, I made a complicated issue there very simple and I presented it. So the question will give the answer, the, the opportunity to, to go into a bit more depth. I think you're right that um, software sharing and software publication, I'm not sure that this idea of data papers and software papers is an ideal way of going forward. It's, it's been used at the moment, you know, partly as one of those things, as something you can do today. In, in, in an environment where promotion for some people is geared around publications and, and measurements that we can make on those, some people complain that Traditional publication is geared around, you know, I asked a research question and I found something out. Whereas if your skill was simply, I didn't do the finding out, but I developed the software that made it possible to do the finding out, or I was the person who understood how to create the beautiful data set that supported those findings. You want a way of documenting your contribution to the research. Software developers that are embedded inside research institutions often find that they're either treated as technicians, in which case they have no career advancement. They're frequently people who started out as researchers and, and, and went in a slightly different direction. As many of the people who work in data centers, as you'll be aware, similarly also we started out with research careers and, and then we found ourselves becoming a different type of specialist and in some cases then stuck with a, an evaluation mechanism and a promotion mechanism that didn't understand how to recognize our contribution to research. That's what those things are trying to fix. I think I'd agree with you that they're not a great way of fixing it. We need to find some of the other ways that have been talked about of, of, of simply recognizing the value of data as an object in itself without even needing to, 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 to write the paper about it w would be good, except that in a sense what both of those things, the data paper and the software paper, are another way of looking at it is they're the documentation. They're the thing that you need to understand how can I take this software and reuse it and adapt it in my own research? How can I take this data and make sense of it? Uh, and in the past, I would have just called it that, you know, data documentation, software documentation, the readme file. It's just a, f a formalization in some sense in these journals of things like that. And, and in that sense, that's no bad thing. If it encourage, you know, anything that encourages people to write documentation, I'm, I'm all for. <laughs> and if you've ever tried to reuse so perhaps even just your own software and data five years after you created it will understand the value uh, of, of documenting things well. Another question. I wanted to ask, is there any consensus about uh, how to select data that should be um, published? Uh, you said that 95% of data is never published. Is there any idea of how much of that you would like to publish? Like. There, there's a scientist, a single person, he has his lab book, he has lots of experiments that failed. Uh, if, if you assume that other postdocs around the world should be able to find these experiments and not repeat them, then this is close to we want to publish all of these 95%. Okay. What is a practical guideline? So publish, we may know they need to, to, this is getting a bit more to thinking about how do we do future scholarly communication. On that simple issue of choosing data, appraising data, that guidance uh, on the right there, how to appraise and select research data configuration, was, was produced by us in collaboration with the Australian National Data Service, uh, attempting to you know, get some international agreement uh, on this issue. That's not so much about publishing, it's about how do you choose what to keep? What are the criteria that you might apply? And, and there are then, uh, we're working with others on producing, that's a, again, very general guidance, on applying that in specific domains and specific data centers to say again, what does this mean in a, in a particular context? We're not talking there about publishing in the traditional sense, but about the selection, publishing in the sense of putting in a repository and making it discoverable. That, that's a type of publication. It doesn't involve a commercial publisher, but it's, I, I, I'd use that word. Dealing with the other problem that we, Cameron Nalem referred to about the fact that nearly all the experiments we do are never documented. Um, Cameron's suggestion about that is that we need to be more radical 
about taking the approach even of open notebook science, where effectively you are documenting your experiments on an ongoing basis. And again, it, it's getting quite far away from the idea of publishing a paper about, I did this experiment and it didn't work. Uh, but to, again, to, to, to exploit things like electronic lab notebooks to make it possible to discover that somebody else tried to do something. Uh, I think it, th there are different routes to take depending on the type of failure. You know, one, one is where I tried this experiment and it just doesn't work. You, know, you, you don't get anything out, you can't measure anything. That, that's one type of thing where you can say it's a negative result. There are ways to do that. Another is I did an experiment, I made some beautiful measurements. The thing I wanted to find out isn't there. So I didn't publish anything about it. And at the moment, there's no incentive to say, but here's my beautiful data, maybe there's something you can do with it. There's no incentive to do that uh, because we don't get any credit for that happening. And their data publishing is a way, perhaps, to give us credit for the fact that I designed a good experiment and I did great measurements. I myself failed to make a discovery as a result of that. But I still, that was good scholarship to be able to do that. And I should get some credit for, the, for that. But, but I agree, it's still, it's a developing area, and, and it's, a, it's about culture as much as anything else. Okay, another question here? Um, could you please refer to the statement that these days blogging may have faster and higher impact than, actual, than an actual publication or a book? Sorry, would I say that the blogging in general does have more impact. I, I, I don't think I have the data to be able to say for definite <laughs> whether it will always have higher impact. I think we have anecdotal evidence that it can produce higher impact. One thing we know for certain is that using techniques like blogging can, in as well as other more traditional means uh, of scholarship, certainly increases the impact of your research. Uh, I think there's, uh, I can't remember the, the, the name of the paper now, but I know it's by Melissa Terrace. She's a humanities scholar at, at UCL who did now, what I think is quite an, an unusual experiment to come from the humanities domain. She had begun to, to, to write a blog about her publications, a, a, a backlog of publications she produced over 12 years, and decided to experiment with blogging about some of her papers and not others, and measuring the effects on the citation rates to her papers as she wrote each blog post. She showed a really positive effect there that by writing about her own work in a different way, it increased the impact of the original scholarly publication. Simple things, which is not surprising to me. That you find some other way of publicizing what you do, instead of just saying, I've sent it to the publisher, I sit back, not my job anymore. Somebody else can, can, can publicize my work. So that, I, I think using all these different mechanisms in concert um, can work well together. It, it's, I think it's difficult because not everyone can naturally write well in that way, can blog about their research. Some of us are very social creatures and it comes easy to us, and some of us aren't. And I think we then have to rely on somebody else to be able to do that uh, more um, informal uh, publicity around our own research. But uh, well, the other question, can, can we just achieve it by blogging? Indeed, that the, the real open science advocates like Cameron uh, and others, I think, would say that that is actually the direction we ought to go. Uh, and I think it's quite possible that that's the type of environment we'll end up with. Perhaps that's the sort of thing that Martin's going to be talking about tomorrow. I don't know. But we're, I know there's going to be a lot more futurist idea of, of, of what scholarship can mean. But I suspect lunch is... Um... Yes, uh, I would like to suggest we continue <laughs> over lunch. And uh, our afternoon session is very packed, so I would like to ask you to try to be on time half past. Here. And the lunch is waiting outside. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you.